Welcome to this uh, online talks uh, event. My name is Kyriakos Kourousis. I'm the chair of the Royal Aeronautical Society Airworthiness and Ma Maintenance Specialist Group. Uh, this is the first of the 2021 uh, talk series and uh, we're glad to have you here attending this first uh, talk. Uh, before we start, uh, a few words uh, about the society. Uh, the Royal Aeronautical Society is the only global organization uh, serving the entire aviation and aerospace community as both a learned uh, society and a professional engineering institution. The society is independent, evidence-based and authoritative, relying on a, a body of knowledge going back more than 150 years. The society plays a leading role in influencing uh, opinion on aviation and aerospace matters through various means including publications, social media profile, interaction with the governments and extensive events uh, programs. About our group, the Airworthiness and Maintenance uh, Specialist Group uh, is concerned with all aspects of uh, airworthiness and maintenance and subject uh, matters including design, production, type certification, continued airworthiness and its management, maintenance of aircraft and uh, the associated components. Of course, we cover all aspects around personnel and organizations. Uh, we, we are involved in the in this array of activities, uh, uh, products and processes development. Uh, the group is led by a committee uh, that uh, provides inspiration and leadership strategies for the aerospace industry to consider. This committee uh, assists the society with the development of the aerospace industry and its uh, people. We organize events such as uh, today's event visits, contribute articles to the aerospace magazine or government consultations, also articles in the uh, society's journal as well. We welcome volunteers to get in touch with us and at the end of the presentation we will provide you with uh, how you can stay in touch with us and how you can contribute by contacting us. So with uh, no further ado, I would like now to present our uh, guest speaker for today. Uh, a few words about uh, Daniel. Daniel Lufisand is a proficient consultant in the initial and continued airworthiness of aircraft. He is an incorporated engineer with the, registered with the UK Engineering Council, which is the regulatory body for the engineering profession. He is also a member of the society and an elect member of the society's council. Uh, he has uh, more than 15 years of experience in the airworthiness sector spanning throughout the industry and academia and he is currently the training director and principal airworthiness consultant at Wink Engineering Limited. So uh, during the presentation uh, as I uh, wrote in the chat box uh, you have the opportunity to ask questions. Okay so there's a section uh, in Teams where you, you will uh, be able to uh, uh, write your questions and we will be able to answer them after afterwards at the Q&A session. So Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, good morning to you all. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, thanks to the Royal Aeronautical Society for inviting me uh, to uh, essentially kick off the lecture series on uh, various awareness related topics. Um, I won't go through my bio anymore. I think uh, Kyriakos has done a good job to, to sort of give a, a bit of a, an overview as to my background and what I do as a day job. So I'm just going to jump straight into my presentation uh, to keep to time. So that's the outline. Uh, that's what I'll be covering today very briefly, um, starting with a sort of overview really uh, of the key points of Park Camo. Um, and then I'll cover the next three points, which essentially, if you've had a chance to read the synopsis for the event, um, is a discussion on the contextualization of safety management uh, in relation to camels specifically. Um, what it is essentially is, from my experience, um, what I've found in my dealings with clients is that um, you know, they complain about the fact that, uh, you know, before they come to us, they, 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 there's lots of um, generic information about safety management systems out there, uh, but they fail to find materials, you know, that, that contextualizes safety management uh, to, 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 you know, a camel uh, uh, context. 
Um, so a lot of them are saying essentially, uh, what does safety management mean for us? Can we have specific examples uh, as to how to interpret uh, you know, the various uh, uh, implementing rules in relation to safety management, uh, which uh, has just been introduced by, by Pat Carmel, uh, specifically to uh, the context in which we are operating as a, uh, as a Carmel. So that, that's essentially what I'll try to do uh, in uh, points two, three and four, is just to, uh, those are the, those particular topics, the safety goal and objective, safety performance indicators and safety hazard identification, it's all three key areas where, um, you know, I popularly get um, uh, queries uh, from clients that approach me to say, you know, can you help us? Can you help, help us sort of contextualize uh, this discussion on safety management? Uh, and then uh, I will just touch on very briefly uh, on the safety review board and action group. Uh, so the SRB and the SAG also, uh, uh, you know, stemming from the new part common requirements. And then quickly talk talk about uh, safety training and uh, wrap things up there. Right. Uh, so starting with part common key points, just to remind ourselves, I expect we're all familiar uh, with what. Uh, the new Pat Camo, uh, uh regulatory requirements uh, essentially bring to the fore. Well, let, let's have a quick look. Um, so it was introduced by Regulation EU number 2019 1383. Uh, it became applicable on 24th March 2020. Uh, it has been designated as Annex VC of the Continuing Awareness Regulation, which is um, uh, regulation number 1321 slash 2014. Uh, it introduces SMS principles to continue awareness management, which of course is the focus of our uh, discussion today. Um, it will gradually replace part M sub so part G, uh, which is also referred to as part MG. It covers the following aircraft, uh, complex motor powered aircraft and Aircraft used by air carriers licensed in accordance with regulation number 1008 slash 20 uh, slash 2008, I beg your pardon. So essentially uh, that particular regulation there, uh, just quickly mentioned, that's the regulation that uh, deals with intra-community uh, aircraft uh, or intra-community aircraft operations. Uh, so in other words, aircraft operations that begin and, and terminate uh, within the EU. In terms of the transition arrangement, um, uh, the guidance in relation to transition arrangement provided by IASA, uh, so the key points are, so as an organization, there is already uh, uh, an approved CAMO in accordance with Part M, so Part G. Uh, once you're ready to transition, you're required to contact your competent authority uh, to request that they issue uh, an approval, an approval certificate on IASA Form 14 in accordance with Part CAMO. Um, thereafter, uh, your oversight as an organization uh, by your competent authority would happen in accordance with Part CAMO. However, uh, you would have on, up until the 24th of September uh, 2021 to essentially close all the uh, findings uh, associated with uh, the aspects of um, uh, the Part CAMO requirements that are not contained in Part M sub Part G. So basically, when you request for that transition to happen, you would automatically have findings because uh, there are aspects of the new framework, the Part CAMO framework, that are not detailed within the uh, Part M sub Part G framework, e.g. the safety management system we've just been talking about. So uh, that would lead to automatic an automatic list of findings. What we're saying here is, um, according to the tra transition requirements, you will have up until the 24th of September this year to, to essentially clear those findings. Uh, if you do not do that uh, by the required time, uh, then essentially your approval as a CAMO can be revoked uh, or it may be limited or indeed suspended in whole or in part. Uh, that will be the uh, prerogative of the um, competent authority, depending on, if you like, the severity of any non-compliance findings that are yet to be closed. And final, finally, the key point, uh, final key point on this is uh, that Part MG approvals will cease to be valid 
uh, on the 24th of September 2021. So I'll expect by now, really, most organizations, you know, have commenced the transition and are, are kind of in the process of closing uh, the uh, non-compliance findings, uh, as I've just referred to uh, a short while ago. Uh, certainly, if you've not started, you, you, I'll, I'll, dare I say, you're, you're running a bit late and you don't want to believe in things at the last minute, I'll expect uh, that you kick things off, uh, you know, ASAP. Uh, for further information about the uh, guidance from EASA in relation to transition, uh, there's a publication uh, they've put out there. Uh, the link there is not, uh, it's a hyperlink there, uh, but if you just Googled uh, Guide for Transition to Part Camo as it is on there, uh, because it's a double guide, that's why it's written that way, it's, it applies to Caro and, and Camo. Um, but if you just Google that, you know, it should be one of the first links that comes up, uh, the link to, to the guidance document. I'll again expect that we've all seen this guidance, but if you uh, you know, on this call, and I, I yet to be familiar with this guidance, I'll highly recommend that you, you uh, Google that and have a look. Another thing that uh, uh, Pat Camo introduces, you know, as part of this sort of um, list of things, you know, it, it uh, brings to the fore really uh, as an improvement to the regulations is uh, a reference to the term management system. And the way to think about this essentially, uh, it's a single system. Uh, that has got two subsystems essentially uh, the com compliance monitoring system, the CMS, and the safety management system. Now, the compliance monitoring system, for all intent, practical intents and purposes, really is akin to what was referred to as the quality system in part M sub so part G. Um, but of course, it makes very clear from the new uh, sort of uh, reference. Uh, what the whole point of that particular subsystem is. It's about essentially facilitating compliance with all the required standards uh, within the regulation. Um, so that name, I think, as I said, um, it, it provides clarification, uh, you know, to the regulated organizations, because again, uh, with previous, you know, when we had the sort of part M sub part G scenario and people seeing the term quality systems for new organizations in particular, it tend to confuse them in terms of what uh, essentially we expected to do in that particular process. Uh, so I think this brings a lot of clarity in that respect. With regards to the safety management system, you'll also recall uh, from ICAO Annex uh, 19 uh, that the SMS is split into four key components. Uh, safety policy in the ICAO, ICAO Annex, it does say safety policy and objectives, but I've kept it safety policy here because I believe objectives are, objectives are an implicit part of your safety policy. Uh, but of course, that uh, uh, you know comprises of your safety commitments and objectives, uh, your safety accountability and responsibilities, uh, safety personnel appointment, emergency response plan, and uh, safety documentation. And then you've got your safety risk management, uh, which is uh, your comprises of two strands: your safety hazard identification, your safety risk assessment and mitigation. And then you've got safety assurance, which has got three strands, uh, your safety performance measurement and monitoring, continuous safety improvement, and then management of change. And uh, finally, you've got safety promotion, uh, which essentially has three strands, the safety education, safety training, and safety communication. Um, I mentioned these four key strands because the first thing we tend to advise our clients is um, to essentially structure uh, their compliance monitoring system uh, in equivalent for component components, as you can see on my uh, uh, slide there. Um, so you've got uh, four components equivalent to the four components on the safety management system as part of the ICAO framework. The reason we ask our clients to do this is basically when you see, you know, when you do this, when you engage in this exercise, and I'm not, I've not got time to go through in details what you know, uh, the details of each of those four components are for the compliance monitoring system. But when you engage in that exercise, what it does is it helps you to see the synergies between the two systems and where they overlap and where, you know, essentially they complement each other. And of course, that helps you to be able to um, better appreciate how both subsystems work together as a part of a coherent whole 
which as, I, as I've referred to, uh, is dubbed management system as part of the new regulatory framework. But of course, our discussion today will be focused on the safety management system aspects. Right, um, so let's jump straight in. Um, safety goal and objectives. So from a CAMOS perspective, when we say safety goal, what exactly does this mean? So we define it as uh, the safety goal of a CAMO and essentially the basis of its existence is to ensure that the aircraft in its care are physically in an airworthy state while in service with pertinent documentary evidence to substantiate this. Okay, so there's two strands to that goal. Okay, we're saying the CAMO, it's, it's, it's the CAMO's responsibility to ensure that the, the aircraft, all of the aircraft in its care, are in a state, you know, are physically in a state of being airworthy or in a state of being suitable for safe flights, how we define airworthy. And not just saying that, but they should be able to demonstrate that with documentary evidence. And we're talking here about, um, you know, the continual witness records of the aircraft, you know, the aircraft technical logbook, sorry, technical log, the logbook, uh, engine logbook, propeller logbook, etc. Uh, you've got the certificate of airworthiness, you've got the current ARC, uh, which is your airworthiness review certificate. So all of those documents and registration certificates as well, uh, which essentially substantiates uh, the fact that an aircraft is in an airworthiness, airworthy state when in service. So that, that's our goal. That's as a CAMO, that's essentially you know, the bottom line for, for your organization, really, in terms of what you're trying to achieve. So having defined that goal, um, as a minimum, then we need to establish three objectives. Uh, the first is to recognize both potential and actual deviations from the safety goal. Because the safety goal is what we want to achieve, what is where we want to be all the time as an organization. So it's important that when there are uh, potential deviations, uh, and we say potential there because we, we, we recognize that the safety management system is primarily a proactive system. So we're not necessarily waiting until problems happen. We want to spot the, you know, things that could lead to uh, issues arising and deal with them at that stage. But then, of course, if those issues fall through, through the safety net, as it were, then those actual deviations too, uh, we want to essentially pick them up and, and deal with them, essentially, which is why I phrased it that way, potential and actual deviations from the safety goal. Of course, once you've recognised that, you need to devise corrective actions to address such uh, deviations. And then, of course, you want to then monitor and evaluate the effectiveness of such actions, because, of course, what you don't want is uh, those problems uh, reoccurring uh, because you've not dealt with them properly. So that's it in a nutshell, really. Uh, from a CAMO's perspective, that, that's the way to look at things. And then we jump straight into uh, safety performance indicators. Your safety performance indicators essentially are metrics that help you to judge how well you're doing in relation to your safety goal and objectives, which you've just defined. So we can um, have a think, uh, you know, pause to have a think about, well, what metrics will be most appropriate then to help us, um, you know, essentially gauge our performance in relation to our safety goal? If you think about it for a second, um, think about specifically what an airworthiness review is. It's a periodic audit, which uh, essentially an aircraft would need to undergo typically every 12 months. Although we know there's provision in the uh, regulatory requirements that allows you to extend twice, uh, provided uh, conditions are met. We won't go into all of that, but typically, uh, you know, it's it's a 12 month period, and um, it's a periodic audit that essentially consists of two strands. Uh, essentially a survey of the physical state of the aircraft and a survey of its records and documentation. So thinking about it then, that directly links into what we just defined as the safety goal of the CAMO. So the airworthiness review then is, or the findings of an airworthiness review then, are a very good metric to tell us then how well the CAMO is doing in relation to its safety goal. So number of airworthiness review findings in a given period. Um, so that's our first sort of uh, key metric uh, as far as our safety performance indicators are concerned. Now, 
uh, the given period there will depend on the organization. It could be monthly, it could be quarterly, it could be annual, annually. It, it all depends on the size and complexity of the organization and the amount of data you're generating in relation uh, you know, to this uh, particular parameter. Another uh, consideration then as far as um, uh, you know, the, the, the um, SPI is concerned then is uh, airworthiness related safety events. Um, so again, our focus here, I've underlined that because our focus here is on airworthiness related events. There are lots of safety events uh, that an aircraft can be involved in. Not all of them are relevant to us as a camel. Uh, so as an example, for instance, if you had a, uh, you know, a, a pilot error uh, during a flight that results in an accident, that's not an airworthiness related issue. It's a pilot error. Of course, that needs to be dealt with, but um, you know, it's it's a flight ops issue. Um, so once we've had the result of an investigation and it's very clear, you know, we've looked at the various sorts of um, uh, root causes of the event and there's no direct link to airworthiness, then it's not applicable. We are only interested specifically in, in events, safety events that are directly related uh, or, you know, have a, where, where airworthiness had a role to play, if you like, in the in of the particular event. So, uh, you know, again, as in that sort of random example here, uh, you know, uh, an explosion in the in the um, cabin of an aircraft, uh, in the cargo hold of an aircraft due to some explosive cargo is not an airworthiness issue. It's an issue, it's a safety issue, but it's not an airworthiness issue. Um, air traffic and incidents resulting from air traffic errors or whatever, those are not airworthiness issues, you know, and they need to be dealt with by the various safety management systems of those various organizations involved. And of course, there should be collaboration where, where that is applicable. But what we're saying here is as far as the CAMO is concerned, our primary focus is on airworthiness related issues specifically, because that's our remit and that's what links to directly to our safety goal. Um, I've included a couple of notes here very quickly just to mention that number of safety events uh, metric, as I defined it earlier, can be further split into two. Uh, number of major awareness related safety events in a given period or, or and I should say a uh, number of minor awareness related safety events in a given period. So that will split things into three uh, SPIs as opposed to two if you weren't splitting them. But of course, if you're doing that, you need to very clearly define uh, what constitutes a major and what constitutes a minor uh, safety event within your uh, safety management manual or uh, uh, your continuing awareness management exposition. So what about uh, setting targets? Because when we talk about, you know, number of uh, awareness review findings and number of um, uh, awareness related safety events, these figures in themselves, uh, you know, are not sufficient to tell us how well we're doing unless we've got like a sort of target. So we're looking at those figures in relation to set targets. So what I just wanted to mention quickly here was then, well, if we're just starting out as an organization in terms of um, establishing our safety management system and defining um, uh, targets for SPIs, you know, where do we get the figures from? Where do we get started? Um, generally, my recommendation is to look at the previous 12 months uh, as an organization in terms of the data uh, in relation to those two parameters. So um, uh, looking at your, your airworthiness review findings in the previous 12 months and uh, looking at, you know, uh, um, major and minor safety, airworthiness related safety events uh, in the past 12 months and then create, you know, establish a benchmark, uh, you know, based on those figures. Of course, I've put in brackets there of safe operations because when you're looking at to establish that benchmark, of course, if you've had a you know a very bad 12 months, you don't want to be using that as your benchmark. You want to look at the you know a period where you've had relatively safe operations um, to use as a, your sort of a, as I said initial benchmark to get things going. Uh, but of course, it's expected that as your SMS matures, as you become better at what you're doing. Uh, that uh, target should be revised downwards towards zero because, of course, with all of those numbers, with all those metrics, you know, the lower the better. Um, it's probably unrealistic to get to a point where you probably have, uh, you know, zero uh, non-compliance findings in your airworthiness review every single time. But what we're saying is you want to be as close to zero 
and you know perhaps in, on, in some years you will achieve that but as much as possible you want to be as close as possible to zero and your as you mature as an organization your target should essentially re, you know reflect that um of course what we're, in, in relation to um awareness related safety events in due course as our sms you know matures i'll expect that um you know zero should be the ultimate target you know for that particular parameter um, so moving one step further then, how about um, safety performance indicators linked to the safety objectives, which we essentially previously defined? Um, so uh, I've just noted here, number of repeat awareness review findings in a given period. So again, if you think about it, what did we define as our safety objectives? We said it's uh, essentially recognizing potential and, and actual deviations from the safety goal. And the reason why we're trying to identify that is so that we can address it with corrective action and then ensure that the corrective action works. If we have a situation where we're getting repeat airwardness review findings, uh, or we're getting repeat airwardness related safety events, uh, you know, in a given period, of course, that tells us that the implementation of the safety objectives, you know, there's something wrong, you know, with that implementation. You're not quite doing something right. So, again, it's a very good metric to tell us how well we're doing in relation to our, our safety objectives for that reason. And of course, with the uh, second uh, point on there, the number of repeat awareness review um, related uh, safety events of course you can split that again into major or minor and then in top in terms of uh, an initial target for this i would say you want to go straight in uh to aim for zero on those on those particular parameters so your targets essentially to be should be set to to zero because essentially you really don't want to be getting repeat airwardness review findings or repeat uh safety related uh you know airwardness uh, events uh, so, so you want to be, you know, aiming from the get go to do a good job at, you know, if you do find issues, you are address them in a way that ensures they don't happen again, as opposed to, you know, having that metrics essentially climb above zero. So I think that's an ideal target from the onset. For the others, as I said, you know, the other one we looked at, you may start at figures above zero, but ultimately you want to move towards zero. Right. So in a nutshell, we've got four um, SPIs, which I think, you know, should be as a minimum uh, the, the, the sort of uh, key uh, or fundamental SPIs to kick off your, your SMS. Of course, it could be five, as I said, if you decide to split. Uh, sorry, it could be six, I beg your pardon, if you decide to split uh, 0.2 and 0 0.4 uh, into major and minor. But like I just indicated there, the list is not exhaustive. Right, let's jump straight in then, just uh, being mindful of time. Let's jump straight in then to uh, safety hazard identification then. Uh, some quick preambles. Um, where exactly is a safety hazard? A safety hazard may be defined as anything that has the potential to cause harm to people and or damage to assets. So uh, when we say anything there, it could be a physical object or it may be a condition. Um, as long as essentially it has uh, the potential to cause harm, uh, you know, uh, to people and or to uh, damage to assets, then we say it's a safety hazard. And within an aviation context in particular, we mean when we say people, we mean passengers, crew, uh, members of the public, because of course, if an aircraft drops onto a house, for instance, and kills people down below, you know, you, you've essentially, uh, you know, caused problems for people that were not even involved in, 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 in you know, in, in, in a particular journey, as it were, within uh, the context of uh, flight ops. So we're not looking just at you know people on the plane, but also you know in that in that regard, um, members of the public, and of course assets, uh, primarily your your uh, aircraft components and um, uh, aircraft related equipment and tools, etc. Safety hazard identification may be proactive or reactive. So let's have a look at, uh, you know, uh, proactive uh, methods for the identification of hazards. Uh, I've defined four here, again, not exhaustive, but those are sort of four key, uh, well, consider the four fundamental ways, if you like, to go about um, proactively identifying hazards within your organization. Uh, the use of what we refer to as HAZOP analysis, 
um, the use of safety surveys. Okay, this is where the safety function pushes out so, you know, surveys to uh, all the personnel in the organization to prompt them to look around them uh, and within the context of the work they do uh, to, to, to provide um, any feedback to the organization in terms of any safety issues uh, they, they may uh, encounter in their day-to-day -day job. Whereas with the third one, the use of a safety hazard reporting system, this is where uh, rather than the staff waiting to be prompted by surveys, um, essentially you have a system in place that allows them, um, you know, if they do spot what they consider to be a safety hazard or uh, a safety issue, uh, to report that so that it can be actually investigated and, um, you know, taken up by the safety function. The safety survey, I should say, um, you know, depending on the, again, size and complexity of the organization, you know, is something that can be conducted quarterly or annually, for instance. And then the fourth point I've got there is the review of pertinent external incident and accident uh, event reports. So that's a, a thought where you can pro proactive about identifying hazards uh, within your operation. Um, but we specifically refer to external here because, of course, because it's proactive, it's not about incidents and accidents we've experienced as an organization. But, you know, what incidents and accidents have other uh, continuing awareness management organizations out there experienced? Uh, so looking at um, reports, safety reports published by uh, EASA, uh, by your competent authority, um, looking at uh, reports published by the Air Accident Investigation Bureau, for instance. So it's looking at those reports and sifting through them to find uh, air wetness related uh, incidents and accidents that you could learn from. OK, so so you're looking to learn from it because the fact that it's not happened to you does not mean necessarily your system is perfect. Uh, you may find things in such reports that prompt you to improve your systems to ensure it doesn't, you know, issues like that do not happen to you. So those are the four sort of key proactive uh, ways. Uh, in terms of reactive, obviously, this is when, well, an incident or an accident has happened within your own organization. Of course, that needs to be uh, investigated. The root causes need to be identified. The root cause is essentially ultimately being the safety hazards in this case, uh, which then need to be addressed, um, you know, to deal to deal with that. When you're thinking about hazards, in all in all cases, whether it's proactively or reactively, when you're looking to identify hazards, um, these are the key parameters you should bear in mind in terms of um, uh, considerations you need to make. So you you know in relation to all the various functions within your organization, you're looking at the system concerned, and um, the system then specifically is referring to the policy, procedures, and tools in relation to the given function. Uh, then you're looking at the process, and we define process as system in motion, uh, or the system, uh, you know, being implemented, or in the state of being implemented, as it were. And of course, people implement systems. So you're looking here at, well, who are the people implementing the system uh, within this given function? And then finally, of course, there's the environment, uh, you know, looking at um, essentially the context or the environment within, within which the process is taking place. Uh, so to speak in generic terms, in relation to system, for instance, you may have, um, you know, in terms of prompts when thinking about identifying hazard, you, you, you're looking out for incomplete uh, or uh, inadequate or inappropriate or unclear uh, policies, procedures uh, or tools. And then, of course, on that process, because it's the human element, uh, you're thinking about human factors, you're thinking about capacity and capability. And then, of course, on that environment, you look at, you're thinking about things like, you know, uncomfortable, uh, unsuitable, over demanding. Um, so those are sort of your prompt words, uh, if you like, uh, that you bear in mind when you look at uh, a given function in order to sort of um, uh, look to identify hazards. Right, so let's bring this all into a camel context then. Um, so, of course, uh, not forgetting what we define to be our safety goal and objectives, if we think about what the function of the CAMO is then, um, in particular, MA301 outlines continuing awareness tasks. 
I'm not going to go into that in, in any detail, be mindful of time, but you know, uh, you can make a note of that reference if it's not one you're familiar with. MA301 outlines uh, what's defined as continual awareness tasks, which essentially are the core tasks of the camel. And what we can do essentially is if you think about it, we can broadly split those into three core functions. Okay, um, AMP development and reliability monitoring. So if we introduce a new aircraft type, for instance, into our camo, okay, uh, the first thing we're going to do is develop a maintenance program for the type and, um, and then a reliability program to go with that and to facilitate the reliability monitoring process for the fleet that fall within the aircraft type. So that function covers that. And then you've got the aircraft technical records management function that looks after all the technical records of the aircraft. Um, you know, your aircraft technical log, your aircraft uh, logbook, engine logbook, et cetera, uh, as well as all the sort of pertinent certificates of the aircraft, certificates of airworthiness and, um, you know, current ARC uh, airworthiness review certificate, permit to fly if that applies, et cetera. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the uh, aircraft maintenance planning function. Again, broadly speaking, this covers every aspect of um, essentially uh, uh, planning of the to ensure that the aircraft um, complies with its scheduled maintenance program. But of course, uh, where on scheduled maintenance requirements come up as well, that that is adequately planned for and addressed, uh, ensuring that an appropriate and approved maintenance organization completes the work. Uh, that covers also things like the evaluation of airworthiness directives and service bulletins to determine whether they are mandatory or not or applicable or not, etc. And, and uh, essentially uh, um, um, ensuring that they are, they are completed and, and embodied. So those are your three core functions uh, within within the camel context in relation to those uh, MA301 tasks as, as we defined previously. And so if we focus on this uh, for a second, um, look at each of them, what are, can we then um, essentially define specific examples of hazards in relation to those operations, bearing in mind what we said were our key characteristics, when, you know, to bear in mind when we look at hazard systems, um, you know, the, the people and, and of course the environment. So I've noted some examples for, for us here to put things in context on that AMP development and reliability monitoring. So an example, for instance, uh, of the hazard will be inadvertent omission of an out-of-phase task from an aircraft's uh, maintenance program. So in the course of putting the maintenance program together, the, you know, a, a particular out-of-phase task is omitted. That's obviously a hazard because, of course, that means when it comes to planning for the maintenance of the aircraft to happen, so when the planning function gets on the job, that task would never be planned. And of course, that task, if it keeps being missed, it, you know, it, it could in fact be just one miss of that task could cause problems, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, a uh, significant awareness related problem. And of course, you know, repeated missing of that task, of course, uh, you know, could have very catastrophic uh, implications indeed. So what we're saying here is, you know, the, the inadvertent omission of uh, uh, the OOP task in, the task in this context, then from the perspective of, of a camel in relation to this function is a big hazard. Another example of, an, you know, of a hazard in this context then would be inaccurate evaluation of fleet reliability. So if you essentially um, wrongly evaluate, um, so it could be, so for instance, um, incorrect data, uh, you know, leading to, uh, you know, uh, inaccurate um, figures being fed into the reliability uh, um, evaluation equation, or it could just be the equation used to evaluate fleet reliability in itself is just wrong. And of course, uh, if you have inaccurate information about the state of your fleet reliability, that would um, you know, of course, um, uh, influence, uh, wrongly influence the decisions you make as a result. So if you think your, reliability, your fleet reliability is better than it actually is, for instance, uh, that will, you know, essentially um, lead you to making decisions that you would have otherwise not have made if you realize there was actually an error in the way you've evaluated your fleet reliability. So uh, that's an example, again, of a very specific hazard in that context. Um, Another, again, uh, specific example here will be lack of competence of personnel in AMP and reliability monitoring. Uh, so 
the personnel that you've put to actually get the job done, if they themselves lack the competence to do the job properly, that in itself is a hazard because, of course, you know, if you have a reliability engineer that doesn't know what reliability is, and doesn't know what they're looking for, um, of course, you wouldn't expect to get um, sensible judgment uh, from them when it comes to, you know, uh, looking at all the data and, and making, you know, very coherent and very uh, apt uh, decisions on the maintenance program as a result of that, for instance. Um, in relation to, by the way, that list is not exhaustive. I'm just using that to sort of help us uh, think of how, uh, you know, to begin to specifically look at the various functions within your organizations, uh, you know, within your CAMO, uh, thinking in relation to your safety goal and your safety objectives and uh, and the key parameters I mentioned before, the system, the people, and the environment in relation to your you know, specific functions in your organization to begin to identify what constitutes hazards. You know, and we said there, there are potential, you know, they're, 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 they're any, it's anything that has potential to cause harm. Um, so this list is not exhaustive, but just to get us thinking about how to interpret or identify uh, hazards in particular. So looking at an aircraft technical records management function, for instance, um, a specific example would be uh, erroneous utilization uh, entry into the aircraft technical aircraft logbook. Uh, I beg your pardon in this, in this case. So if an aircraft has done uh, 1000 flight hours, but it's been erroneously entered as 100 flying hours because one zero has been omitted, of course that has implications because um, it has safety implications specifically because of course, uh, planning of the aircraft maintenance, uh, uh, um, all the scheduled maintenance uh, uh, checks and, and, and tasks is based on information in the aircraft's logbook. OK, so if if I'm thinking a task is not due yet because the you know flight hours, which the task is the task interval is based on, is actually 900 flight hours less than it actually is, then I wouldn't be planning for that task to be done when it should be done and of course that could have safety implications so that's an example there of a safety hazard specifically or uh, you know in relation to the aircraft and records function and then of course uh, another example there is absence of a backup system for electronically uh, stored records so um, again uh, the, the hazard there is in the fact that well where you've stored um, uh, records electronically, there's a potential you could lose them um, because, of course, we know with technology sometimes these things can happen. Um, and, and sometimes, of course, it could be that uh, the room in which the computer uh, where you store the records are, it could be, you know, there's a fire and the computer is destroyed. So if you've not got backup, you can access elsewhere. You've lost all of the data that will help you to be able to substantiate uh, the airworthiness state of your aircraft and if you recall i said that's you know the second strand if you like of the safety goal so it's not about just saying we know this aircraft is in a state of being suitable for safe flight in other words it's airworthy but we can substantiate that of course if you lose your records you can substantiate that um, another example there's significant delays in the in the updating of continuous awareness records um, you know so where um uh, the aircraft flight hours, um, you know, has significantly increased, um, you know, due to uh, high um, uh, flight operations activity, but it's taken, you know, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks before the records actually reflect the, you know, the utilize, current utilization of the aircraft, for instance. Obviously, that will have a ripple effect on um, the aircraft planning function, for instance, because they are planning based on outdated data, for instance, uh, or where modification has been embodied onto an aircraft, but it's not reflected in the aircraft logbook. Again, that has implications for how planning works going forward. So that significant delay in itself is a hazard. Um, and of course, then the lack of competence uh, amongst personnel involved in the aircraft and records process. I'm moving a little faster because I think I'm going to run behind schedule. Uh, so in relation to the aircraft maintenance planning function, for instance, an, an example there could be uh, incorrect scheduled uh, maintenance forecasting procedure. So the, the way the procedure is asking you to forecast uh, scheduled maintenance is wrong, and that's producing wrong, wrong forecasts, and, and that, of course, has safety implications. Uh, you've got inadvertent omission of an OOP out of phase task from the scheduled maintenance plan. OK, so that's another one. Uh, and then you've got failure to embody an 
applicable illness directive or mandatory service bulletin. That's a big one. You just, you know, planning the planning function just simply omitted this, you know, for for whatever reason, it could be, um, you know, they did not see the updates, they did not, they saw it, but they didn't deal with it appropriately, whatever, um, but failure to embody an applicable illness directive or SB. And then, of course, again, I've got here as an example, lack of competence of personnel in aircraft maintenance planning. So again, your personnel needs to be competent to be able to essentially deliver on the uh, function. So that's that really. Uh, hopefully uh, that helps us to begin to think about, you know, looking at specific organizations, looking at the various functions, uh, you know, uh, and begin to identify uh, very specifically the sorts of hazards we should be looking out for and dealing with, um, you know, under, under our hazard identification efforts. Um, Point five, safety review board and action group. Um, so why I just wanted to touch on it, because these are uh, new terms really, again, introduced by Pat Carmel. I just thought I'd just um, give us a quick overview of what this, um, these bodies essentially um, entail. Uh, so I'll just run through them quickly. This diagram shows uh, the composition, excuse me, of an SRB. Uh, it's chaired by the accountable manager and should consist of your Continuing awareness manager, your awareness review uh, personnel, so all the awareness review personnel in the organization, uh, your compliance monitoring manager, and your safety manager. So, in terms of its function, then, or, or let's let, let's start by sort of defining essentially what it is, um, or shed a bit more light as to what exactly the SRB is. It's a high level committee that considers matters of strategic safety in support of the accountable manager's safety accountability. So you'll recall that the accounting man manager bears overall accountability for safety within the organization. Even though you've got a safety manager, it, you know, the, the ultimate accountability rests with the accountable manager. So the SRB essentially is the vehicle through which the accountable manager essentially keeps on top of things as far as safety is concerned. Core function uh, is to monitor uh, safety performance against safety policy and objectives, um, that any safety action is taken in a timely manner, and the effectiveness of the organization's management system uh, processes. I've noted here as well, the SRB also ensures that appropriate resources are allocated to achieve the established safety objectives. The SRB is not required for small, non-complex CAMO operations. Um, however, um, this is subject to a risk assessment and uh, agreement of the competent authority. So if you think you're a small organization or uh, have non-complex operations and feel you do not need to have an SRB, you need to have that conversation with your competent authority. They would need to, you know, they essentially would, would um, uh, take over those two points, essentially, in the sense they need to risk assess you and make sure that yet that conclusion is right. You don't necessarily need an SRB. Your, your operations are not complex enough. Uh, you're a small organization, say two, two man CAMO, for instance, you know, where the account manager is also the continuing awareness manager and the safety manager is also the compliance monitoring manager. You probably don't need an SRB uh, in that very context where they're looking after maybe one or two aircraft. Um, it's not complex enough. Well, th this, this actually comes into its own, you know, having an SRB comes into his own where you, you've got really complex operations, you know, um, we're talking the likes of, um, you know, your uh, national carriers, etc. cetera, um, you know, with fleets and, you know, aircraft in the hundreds, um, you know, that really gets complex and it just it provides that vehicle for the account manager to keep on top of things. But of course, as I said, you, you need to check where you come to the authority. And of course, if you're not, if, if your SRB is not going to be applicable in the way it's been and required by the regulation, uh, what the regulation then states is that your safety manager needs to take up uh, those functions um, as defined uh, in the previous slide. And then you've got a safety action group, uh, which essentially uh, is the lower part of my slide here. Uh, um, as you can see on there, I've just added it to the previous uh, diagram I showed us of the SRB just to show the relationship between the two. Um, because essentially the, S the SAG, uh, may act on behalf of the safety manager or the SRB as a, as a board. Um, and in terms of its composition, um, essentially it's made up of if the organization has safety personnel, so personnel surplus to the safety manager, uh, you know, if the, if the organization is big enough that it has such personnel present. Uh, and of course, 
a representative of personnel in each function. So aircraft maintenance program development and reliability monitoring, aircraft maintenance plan, aircraft and coracles management, uh, et cetera. So in terms of um, essentially um, various characteristics of this group, really, um, first thing I've just noted here, requirement depends on size and complexity of the organization. So again, you do not necessarily have to have a SAG uh, within your organization if, if you're not big enough or complex enough. Uh, that's a discussion again you should have with your competent authority. Um, it may be established as a standing group or as an ad hoc group. So in other words, um, you know, you could have one permanently established or you could establish one in relation to a specific project or uh, say a safety crisis as a reason and you need uh, to establish one to support the work of the SRB or the safety manager or uh, you know in response to a safety incident or accident for instance and then um, I've also just noted here uh, it assists or act on behalf of the safety manager or SRB uh, I think I mentioned that point already and um, more than one SAG may be established so again depending on size of, and complexity of the organization you do not necessarily need to have just the one SAG you may have three, four, five sites, depending on what it is you're trying to achieve, uh, what the project is and, you know, uh, the sort of expertise you require within each project and, and, and all of that. Uh, I've just noted that there, depending on the scope of tasks and uh, specific expertise required. Right. OK, um, so where exactly is the function then of this group? So the safety action group may be tasked with or assist in monitoring safety for performance, uh, defining actions to control risks to an appropriate level, uh, assessing the impact of organizational changes on safety, uh, ensuring that the safety actions are implemented within agreed time scales, and reviewing the effectiveness of previous safety actions and safety promotion. Right, so the last thing I'm going to touch on very quickly um, is safety training. Excuse me. <coughs> Just grab a glass of water there. Right, so um, Pat Camo essentially uh, introduces what we refer to as safety training, include, safety including human factors training, um, and it mandates this for all Camo professionals. So this is something to bear in mind. Uh, it's 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 a training uh, going forward uh, that every single person within your organization would need to do. So it's essentially a hybrid of um, the sorts of topics we've seen in the human factors training that you know was uh, essentially or is a requirement within a, a maintenance an aircraft maintenance organization. Um, but then uh, linking that and you know uh, bringing that together with safety training essentially showing the link between the two essentially as we kind of touched on before uh, human factors uh, essentially can lead to errors and that makes them a hazard as it were uh, you know which needs to be dealt with uh, within the context of your safety management system so a training that essentially brings all these points home and and, and uh, help personnel to to fully appreciate what human factors is and you know how it could lead to errors as, as it were and, and and how this can be essentially managed what what, uh, what they can do uh, you know to help themselves manage uh, errors they may commit as a result of human factors and of course understand how this all comes together when it comes to uh, bringing that into the context of safety management system so that training is, is, is mandated as I said um, uh, for all personnel within the CAM one, very important to bear in mind. But another thing that CAM requirements do or does is that it um, emphasizes uh, competence related training. And as you would recall, when I looked at hazards there, lack of competence is a big hazard in any given function. Uh, and so it's important that, um, so not just completing safety, safety training is important, uh, as we've noted there, but not just that, it's important that every personnel you've put into a given function to complete the function has got the right competence to get things going within that function. Uh, otherwise, you know, it's it's um, you know it's a breed, it's a hazard. It's a it's a breeding ground. You know, where you, in a scenario where you've got uh, personnel who do not have the right competence and you've put them in a position to do you know to complete a given function, it's a breeding ground for problems. You know, incidents, accidents, uh, safety related uh, to occur within your organization. So it's important that. 
um, you know, you ensure everyone within your organization, uh, whatever functions is they're performing, fully understand and are competent to do the work. Something we've done uh, here at Wing Engineering Limited is to compile, because again, um, organizations we've worked with, uh, you know, one of the things that have come out is sometimes they struggle to um, essentially, um, you know, decide, well, okay, uh, for this particular function, what sorts of training uh, do we need personnel to, to essentially have uh, before we essentially uh, put them in front of the job? Uh, some organizations struggle to understand, um, you know, how should we de develop our personnel? So what we've done is we've put together uh, a free guide. Um, so it's a freely available document on that web link you can see on the bottom there, uh, wingengineering.co.uk slash publications slash camel pro framework um what we've done there is we've looked at camel and we've um, essentially um, um uh, developed a, a basic or a typical structure uh, of a camel which shows all the various uh, key functions within the organizations outline what the responsibilities uh, of individuals within each of those key functions are and then defined in relation to each of those key functions what the uh, appropriate uh, minimum competence requirements are in terms of uh, the training they require and the, the sort of, uh, level of experience they require as well before they get on with the job. So as I said, it's a free document. You can just go onto that website there to download it. It's a PDF document. Right. Um, I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Hopefully, um, I think apologies, I've rushed through things a bit, but hopefully it's given us a bit of a flavor for how to begin to think about uh, safety management within the context of a continuing awareness management organization. Thank you very much, and uh, I'll be happy to take questions. Over to you, Kirakos. Thank you. Daniel, again, uh, special thanks for uh, offering this uh, excellent uh, session. It was very, very informative. Of course, it opened a lot of other questions and uh, an opportunity for people to study. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's always the case with uh, uh, questions. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure and uh, hopefully everyone on, on, on board this session have found found it useful in one way or the other. Thank yes. you. So uh, I would just like to close this uh, talk with some uh, information about uh, about our group, the Airworthiness Maintenance Specialist Group. We have a web page uh, which lives in the society's web page, so it's aerosociety.com slash airworthiness. We have an email uh, where you can communicate with us. There was a question about the certificates of attendance for this event, so uh, members of the society can send uh, requests along with their membership number and we can issue the certificates of attendance. Also, we, we use LinkedIn as a group. Uh, you will find it by searching uh, RIAS Airworthiness Air, Air and Maintenance Specialist Group. You can see the link over there. Uh, it's a long number, but it's easier to search it. Uh, it's an open group, so feel free to join, uh, staying in touch and uh, getting informed about uh, our next uh, events and talks is going to be uh, done the, via that uh, avenue. We have a couple of talks scheduled for June and July. Uh, there will be an announcement and there will be an email circulated and other ways of uh, letting you know about that. Uh, the, there is a mixture of topics that we're going to cover until the end of the year, different aspects as uh, you know very well, airworthiness is a very diverse area. Again, thank you for attending and uh, I hope that uh, uh, this talk was informative. There will be a recording, uh, of course, which is going to become available through the YouTube channel and uh, 